The trouble is, these pious people shut up their reason, and then open their Bible. In the olden times, the existence of devils was universally admitted. The people had no doubt upon that subject, and from such belief it followed as a matter of course that a person, in order to vanquish these devils, had either to be a god or to be assisted by one. All founders of religions have established their claims to divine origin by controlling evil spirits and suspending the laws of nature. Casting out devils was a certificate of divinity. A prophet, unable to cope with the powers of darkness, was regarded with contempt. The utterance of the highest and noblest sentiments, the most blameless and holy life, commanded but little respect, unless accompanied by power to work miracles and command spirits. This belief in good and evil powers had its origin in the fact that man was surrounded by what he was pleased to call good and evil phenomena. Phenomena affecting man pleasantly were ascribed to good spirits, while those affecting him unpleasantly or injuriously were ascribed to evil spirits. It being admitted that all phenomena were produced by spirits, the spirits were divided according to the phenomena, and the phenomena were good or bad as they affected man. Good spirits were supposed to be the authors of good phenomena, and evil spirits of the evil, so that the idea of a devil has been as universal as the idea of a god. Many writers maintain that an idea to become universal must be true that all universal ideas are innate, and that innate ideas cannot be false. If the fact that an idea has been universal proves that it is innate, and if the fact that an idea is innate proves that it is correct, then the believer in innate ideas must admit that the evidence of a god superior to nature, and of a devil superior to nature, is exactly the same and that the existence of such a devil must be as self-evident as the existence of such a god. The truth is, a god was inferred from good, and a devil from bad phenomena. And it is just as natural and logical to suppose that a devil would cause happiness, as to suppose that a god would produce misery. Consequently, if an intelligence, infinite and supreme, is the immediate author of all phenomena, it is difficult to determine whether such intelligence is the friend or enemy of man. If phenomena were all good, we might say they were all produced by a perfectly beneficent being. If they were all bad, we might say they were produced by a perfectly malevolent power. But as phenomena are, as they affect man, both good and bad, they must be produced by different and antagonistic spirits by one who is sometimes actuated by kindness and sometimes by malice, or all must be produced of necessity and without reference to their consequences upon man. The foolish doctrine that all phenomena can be traced to the interference of good and evil spirits has been, and still is, almost universal. That most people still believe in some spirit that can change the natural order of events is proven by the fact that nearly all resort to prayer. Thousands at this very moment are probably imploring some supposed power to interfere in their behalf. Some want health restored. Some ask that the loved and absent be watched over and protected. Some pray for riches, some for rain. Some want diseases stayed, some vainly ask for food, some ask for revivals, a few ask for more wisdom, and now and then one tells the Lord to do as he thinks best. Thousands ask to be protected from the devil, some, like David, pray for revenge, and some implore even God not to lead them into temptation. All these prayers rest upon and are produced by the idea that some power not only can, but probably will, change the order of the universe. This belief has been among the great majority of tribes and nations. All sacred books are filled with the accounts of such interferences, and our own Bible is no exception to this rule. If we believe in a power superior to nature, it is perfectly natural to suppose that such power can and will interfere in the affairs of this world. If there is no interference, of what practical use can such power be? 
the scriptures give us the most wonderful accounts of divine interference. Animals talk like men. Springs gurgle from dry bones. The sun and moon stop in the heavens in order that General Joshua may have more time to murder. The shadow on a dial goes back ten degrees to convince a petty king of a barbarous people that he is not going to die of a boil. Fire refused to burn, water positively declined to seek its level, but stands up like a wall. Grains of sand become lice, common walking sticks to gratify a mere freak, twist themselves into serpents, and then swallow each other by way of exercise. Murmuring streams, laughing at the attraction of gravitation, run uphill for years, following wandering tribes from a pure love of frolic. Prophecy becomes altogether easier than history. The sons of God become enamored of the world's girls. Women are changed into salt for the purpose of keeping a great event fresh in the minds of man. An excellent article of brimstone is imported from heaven, free of duty. Clothes refuse to wear out for forty years. Birds keep restaurants and feed wandering prophets, free of expense. Bears tear children in pieces for laughing at old men without wigs. Muscular development depends upon the length of one's hair. Dead people come to life simply to get a joke on their enemies and heirs. Witches and wizards converse freely with the souls of the departed, and God himself becomes a stone-cutter and engraver after having been a tailor and dressmaker. The veil between heaven and hell was always rent or lifted. The shadows of this world, the radiance of heaven, and the glare of hell mixed and mingled until man became uncertain as to which country he really inhabited. Man dwelt in an unreal world. He mistook his ideas, his dreams, for real things. His fears became terrible and malicious monsters. He lived in the midst of furies and fairies, nymphs and naiads, goblins and ghosts, witches and wizards, sprites and spooks, deities and devils. The obscure and gloomy depths were filled with claw and wing, with beak and hoof, with leering look and sneering mouths, with the malice of deformity, with the cunning of hatred, and with all the slimy forms that fear can draw and paint upon the shadowy canvas of the dark. It is enough to make one almost insane with pity to think what man in the long night has suffered, of the tortures he has endured, surrounded as he supposed by malignant powers and clutched by the fierce phantoms of the air. No wonder that he fell upon his trembling knees, that he built altars and reddened them even with his own blood, no wonder that he implored ignorant priests and impudent magicians for aid. No wonder that he crawled groveling in the dust to the temple's door, and there in the insanity of despair besought the deaf gods to hear his bitter cry of agony and fear. The savage, as he emerges from a state of barbarism, gradually loses faith in his idols of wood and stone, and in their place puts a multitude of spirits. As he advances in knowledge, he generally discards the petty spirits, and in their stead believes in one whom he supposes to be infinite and supreme. Supposing this great spirit to be superior to nature, he offers worship or flattery in exchange for assistance. At last, finding that he obtains no aid from this supposed deity, finding that every search after the absolute must of necessity end in failure, finding that man cannot by any possibility conceive of the conditionless, he begins to investigate the facts by which he is surrounded, and to depend upon himself. The people are beginning to think, to reason, and to investigate, slowly, painfully, but surely, the gods are being driven from the earth. Only upon rare occasions are they, even by the most religious, supposed to interfere in the affairs of men. In most matters we are at last supposed to be free. Since the invention of steamships and railways, so that the products of all countries can be easily interchanged, the gods have quit the business of producing famine. 
Now and then they kill a child because it is idolized by its parents. As a rule, they have given up causing accidents on railroads, exploding boilers, and bursting kerosene lamps. Cholera, yellow fever, and smallpox are still considered heavenly weapons, but measles, itch, and ague are now attributed to natural causes.